it's about the strong dollar. It's also about elevated commodity prices. Well, they have eased somewhat. I mean, how are you assessing the risk of uh, elevated commodity prices as well as the ability uh, of emerging markets to cope with it? Yeah, I think uh, we, we worry about the commodity prices, even though it's stabilized, because it remains high. It's stable, but it remains high. Uh, food prices are still like 40% higher compared to uh, b beginning of the year. Uh, energy prices, obviously, still high. And we think the commodity prices are going to remain high for the next two years, because it takes time to adjust to, you know, depending also, of course, how long the war is going to last. To, to have the supply response, say something like energy, it takes time. So we are predicting like uh, commodity prices will be high for the next two years. What does that mean? It means, including fertilizer, Fertilizers, yeah. It, uh, there's two things that are important: uh, affordability for poor households uh, and and the poorer parts of your population. So uh, we at the bank we are working with countries to come up with uh, support programs to address uh, the high food prices and energy prices for the poor households. Second, you've got to make sure uh, food is available, right? Uh, and this is about making sure you don't have counterproductive trade restrictions, uh, which accentuate the, the price uh, increase. And this is something with the WTO and so on that, that needs to happen. And second, I think we, it, in the 2008 crisis, it was more about food. This time, we have fertilizer in the mix. So if you don't make sure that fertilizers get to farmers in time, you will affect the next season's production. And for our part of the world in Asia, this can affect rice, right? And that's something we need to watch out for. You talk about how prices will remain elevated, but have they peaked? Because some say inflation is close to peaking if they haven't peaked already. There is a, a sense that uh, it may it, it's peaking, uh, but again, uh, it will depend how long uh, the war lasts, how much disruption will happen, how much will fertilizer, uh, shortage of fertilizer, high price of fertilizer will lead to lower production, which will then uh, accentuate uh, the price increase. And then on the energy side, uh, how much diversification uh, can happen uh, in, 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 the, in the short period of time before uh, you will see some uh, elevation in terms of the supply uh, c constraints. Mario Pengestu, when we look at uh, another pressure here, um, we have this uh, report coming through from the United Nations Department of Social and Economic Affairs showing that the global population will hit 8 billion, even though it's slowing down the growth of it, 8 billion by November. This is just adding to the urgency. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's, so while we are addressing the immediate uh, issue of uh, food insecurity, we've got to really address the drivers of food insecurity, which existed uh, before the war, right? So a, a, a large part of what we need to do is also to uh, look at the longer term issues that's driving uh, f uh, lower food production. And that ranges from uh, addressing the climate change issues. It's about uh, improving the, the land uh, management uh, issue, making sure you have sustainable production practices, uh, and investing, investing in agriculture, in including uh, on the research side. So there's, there's a, a short-term program to improve the productivity and the production, and then there's a medium and longer-term program. And it is very much linked uh, to the climate change uh, agenda. Uh, a lot of the uh, decline in food production, say in Africa, has been uh, due to uh, climate-related uh, disasters uh, as well well as uh, uh, dry, very dry hot spots uh, around. And it's driving conflict, it's driving uh, poverty, uh, and driving uh, high uh, uh, yeah. rates of hunger as well. Yeah, but the, okay, now we look at Sri Lanka when uh, they decided to ban fertilizers, for instance. It's caused many, many problems in that country. But is it not the case that as we head for this climate imperative, that getting there may actually also be bad for farming unless it's managed properly. This cannot be solved without cooperation and collaboration. Uh, absolutely. We need cooperation and collaboration, uh, first of all, to make fertilizer available. Uh, and uh, that is something that, that is 
I would say very urgent as well because we don't want to have we want to make sure that production uh, for the next season is not going to be affected because otherwise you will have uh, not just wheat prices going up you may you will have other food prices going up second how do you uh, you know use fertilizers more efficiently and that is related to the fertilizer subsidy uh, programs that are often in place in countries which because it's subsidized it leads to a lot of waste and inefficient use which you know leads to uh, a, a, a contribution also to the climate change so you have to focus on sustainable pra agriculture practices subsidies that are that are uh, more targeted targeted to uh, uh, increasing productivity, increasing uh, sustainable and smart agriculture practices. And you have to do also a lot, there's a lot of homework uh, on the land use uh, management side of it. Of course, it's hit Sri Lanka, it's defaulted, Pakistan could be next. What other countries are at risk? Well, there, you know, uh, there's a, a number out there where low-income countries, uh, I think it's 60, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that are already uh, close to debt distress. And then there are a larger number of uh, middle, increasing number of middle-income countries. But I think what's important is to, to really anticipate this and, and work with the countries uh, as in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, we, will have, we have been working with development partners uh, to look at how we can restore stability and the broader uh, based uh, approach right. of growth but we will have to wait for a new government we will have to wait for the IMF to come in uh, with its program supply chain disruptions have led to the inflation levels that we're seeing right now and it's also led governments to look at uh, bringing manufacturing back home mm -hmm. uh, reshoring onshoring friend shoring some mm -hmm. say what impact might this have on emerging economies I mean it could be detrimental to them and the growth yes uh, this is absolutely something that uh, we need to uh, pay attention to because I still believe trade and investment is still an important source of recovery and growth for developing countries and global value chains have been very important important in that uh, and therefore uh, moving forward how do we make sure that we don't have this uh, short-term view uh, in the name of re resilience and energy security or food security or medical equipment security that you have onshoring or reshoring self-sufficiency is not the answer if the worry is about having uh, enough just-in-time products the answer is diversification yeah. diversification between countries as well as uh, uh, products that are needed. Uh, I think the moment you go for, uh, you know, are you, right. are you going to only trade with those you have alliance with, uh, then you, you, will become, you will have a, a fractured, fragmented world that will uh, actually exclude uh, developing countries. Um, Mary Pega, so just one other thing to note here. It, it, it should a lot more uh, money be going into the politics of all this and enhancing democracy because, uh, I mean, there's a statistic that there's, there's never been a famine in a democracy. <laughs> I think uh, this is uh, well. It's part yes, partly uh, bad policies that are driven by by maybe bad politics, uh, and and this is something uh, obviously uh, for food. Yeah, something like food. All countries, all governments. I have been in government before. Uh, the the issue of food availability and food price uh, is is uppermost in in many governments' minds, and therefore it does have to be uh, couched in in in. Uh, in good policies as well, because what you don't want is controlling price. What, what we don't want to happen right now in the food insecurity situation is controlling prices uh, for the whole population, because A, it's going to be fiscally heavy on you, uh, and second, uh, it, it's, it's not helping the supply and demand responses that needs to happen. What you need to happen is, what needs to happen is to you protect the, the poor and vulnerable, and this can be a, a flexible program and expand it to a wider part of the population, but not uh, for the whole population, because it will affect the supply and demand responses that you want uh, to happen uh, to, to address the, the, the food uh, shortage gap as well, right? So uh, I, think, I think we need to work with governments to ensure that they can have uh, the right policy framework, and mindful of the fact that uh, it's uppermost in their mind uh, how to ensure that they protect the, the people in, in their countries.